All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we are gonna talk about the cochlea. So if you guys haven't already, please go and watch our video on the anatomy of the inner ear. The reason why is we said in that video that we're gonna dissect the different parts of the actual inner ear. Specifically, in this video, we're gonna talk about the cochlea. In another video, we'll talk about the vestibule. And in another video, we'll talk about the semicircular canals. And then we'll have the vestibular pathway and the auditory pathway going through a central nervous system. So let's go ahead and dig right into the cochlea. All right, so in the inner ear, right, we have this specialized structure here called the, the actual, the inner ear, we have this structure here called the cochlea, right? So the cochlea kind of looks like the little snail shell right here. The cochlea is extremely, extremely important. If you guys remember, just a brief little point here, we said that there's an outer bony part, right, of the actual cochlea. We said that the top part is going to be called what's known as the scala, vestibuli, I'll abbreviate that SV. Then we said the bottom part was gonna be the scala, tympani. Both of these guys were filled with perilymph, which is a harder substance, higher in sodium, low in potassium, very close to the consistency of cerebral spinal fluid. But in the middle of the two, we had this nice little blue layer here, right? This nice baby blue layer. This one we refer to as the scala media, or you can also hear it as the cochlear duct. Now, the scala media is different because this is the one that's actually consisting of endolymph. Now, endolymph is different from perilymph. How? Perilymph is a higher sodium, lower potassium. Endolymph is just the exact opposite. So endolymph is a higher potassium content, lower sodium content. And that's really important. We'll talk about the structure that helps to maintain the potassium levels, which is over here called the stria vascularis. We'll talk about him afterwards. All right, so now, in order to appreciate this structure, the cochlea, what I'm gonna do is, is I'm gonna take a section. I'm gonna take a section of the cochlea and look at it, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over here. There's a little section over here. Now imagine here, there's a little bone, all right? There's a little bony part here, and this bony part is kind of like a little cone. They call this bony point here, they call it the modulus, okay? They call this the modulus. Now the modulus is interesting. All right, the modulus is kind of like this conical bone structure, right? And then around the modulus, the cochlea is spinning around it. So it's spinning around it. And it actually makes about two and a half turns around the modulus. So what you're seeing here is imagine there's this center bony structure here called the modulus. And then around that modulus, twisting around it is the cochlea. All right, and we're just looking at a section of it. So now this is gonna be a cochlea, cochlea, cochlea. But if we look now, now we have an even better look at the cochlea. So if you look here in the cochlea, we can better see anatomically the different chambers. So here's the modulus, and going down, right, you have this little part here, this little blue part here. That little blue piece that's coming off of the modulus, they call that the spiral limbus. All right, so this little kind of like bony projection. Now, what happens is from the spiral limbus, you're going to have these different membranes that are radiating out within this cochlea that separates it into those three nice little chambers. The top one above this pink layer, so above the pink one, this is called the scala vestibuli, right? That's the scala vestibuli. Below the blue layer is called the scala tympani. And then in between the blue and the pink layer is going to be the one that we're gonna to try to focus on here. It's the scala media, or the cochlear duct, all right? Now, remember again, scala vestibuli, scala tympani contain perilymph. More of kind of a harder substance, high in sodium, very low in potassium. Scala media, endolymph, rich in potassium and low in sodium, all right? And it's due to a structure called the stria medullaris. So now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take and zoom in on one of these actual cochlear turns here. So we're gonna zoom in on that one right there, blow it up so we can see the structures associated with it. So, so far we took the cochlea, made a section, we see the modulus and all the different cochlea spiraling around it. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in specifically on this one right here and look at the structures associated with it. All right, so here we go. Again, here's the modulus, right? And you know, there's two windows. Okay, there's two windows. One here, this is called the oval window. This one here is called the oval window. And this one down here is called the round window. 
We're going to mention these a little bit later, but here's the important thing. The cochlea is specifically associated with sound waves. So real quick, you know that whenever I'm talking to you guys, it's coming through sound waves. Those sound waves are coming out of your speaker or your laptop or your phone, whatever it is. And those sound waves are moving. They're like sine waves. They actually get funneled into the ear canal through the pinna or the auricle, right? And then when they get funneled into the ear canal, they move down the ear canal and push on the tympanic membrane. When it pushes on the tympanic membrane, it causes the tympanic membrane to move. It compresses it and then it decompresses it. When it compresses it, guess what happens? It moves these little bones in the ear that we talked about in the anatomy of the middle ear video. And that was actually called the ossicles. Now what happens is it first moves, as it beats in, it moves the malleus, then it moves incus, then it moves stapes. And then what does stapes do? If you remember, we could imagine here's stapes. Here's the foot plate of stapes. You know it's actually connected to the oval window through annular ligaments. And what happens is it keeps tapping keeps tapping the pop, 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 right onto the oval window. As it's tapping on the oval window, it's turning mechanical stimuli, the actual vibrations, right, from the ossicular chain into fluid-filled vibrations. Because again, what is this part up here? This is the scala vestibuli, which is filled with perilymph. Right here is the scala media, or the cochlear duct, which is filled with endolymph. And then below this is the scala tympani, which is filled with perilymph. So we have a mechanical transduction turning into a fluid transduction. So it's actually going to be mechanical vibrations turning into fluid filled vibrations. That's what's really cool about sound. So again, remember that the cochlea is specifically responding to sound waves, getting funneled into the ear canal, vibrating the tympanic membrane, moving the ossicular chain, and then tapping on the oval window to create fluid fill vibrations within this cochlear structure. The specific one that we need to focus on though is this guy right here. This right here, within the scala media, you have this part here which is going to be called the, the actual spiral organ of corti, and we'll talk about that in a second. Before we do that though, let's get a little bit of our uh, kind of the structural anatomy down here. So first thing we have here, again we have that like spiral limbus, and then you have this pink little uh, structure right here. This is a membrane. And this membrane is separating the scala vestibuli from the scala media, or the cochlear duct. What do we call this membrane right here? We call this the vestibular membrane. Simple, right? It's the vestibular membrane. If you want, there's, there's another name for it called the Reasoner's membrane. All right, so you can remember that. I'm not going to try to spell it because I'll probably butcher it. But for simplicity purposes, we're going to keep it as the vestibular membrane. But do realize that there is another name for it called the Reasoner's membrane. Now, the vestibular membrane or Reasoner's membrane separates the scala vestibuli from the scala media. There's another membrane, which is this blue membrane right here. This nice blue membrane. This nice blue membrane right here is going to be separating the scala tympani from the scala media. What is this membrane here called? This membrane is called the bacillar membrane. The bacillar membrane is of, out of these all membranes, the most important. Bacillar membrane is really interesting, okay? It's actually made up of a lot of elastic fibers, really, really stiff elastic fibers. But what's really, really cool is, I actually, I need to show you guys something here. Well, let's, let's do another diagram, a small little diagram over here. It's not going to be anatomically uh, correct, but it's going to be physiologically um, understandable here. So let's say here I'm going to have a tube, right? There's my tube. And then in that, I'm going to have this nice little structure here. Let's do this in green. And this is going to be my cochlear duct or my scala media. What happens is the scala media right, has this little membrane a part of it. If you guys remember what that membrane we said, the most important one, that was the bacillar membrane. The bacillar membrane is really interesting because remember I said that we have sound waves, right? And the sound waves is creating fluid fill vibrations. What happens is those fluid fill vibrations as they travel through the scala vestibuli, they hit the bacillar membrane. So remember here was our oval window, here was our round window. And remember the stapes was hitting on the oval window creating fluid filled vibrations within the scala vestibuli and then down here is the scala tympani. 
what happens is as these actual fluid filled vibrations are moving, it stimulates different portions of the bacillar membrane. You're probably thinking, why is that important? So if I'm talking in a different frequency, okay? So how do we define frequency? What is frequency? Frequency, if I look, look here, let's say I have a graph here, right? And on this graph, I'm gonna have time here on the x-axis and I'll have pressure here on the, on the y-axis, right? What happens is frequency is basically determine, it determines our pitch. So you can look here, the top part of this actual graph represents kind of like your amplitude. So the higher it goes up, the higher the amplitude. But the closer these waves are to one another, the higher the frequency. So more frequency actually is going to be really important for being able to determine pitch. So again, what's really important about frequency? Frequency determines pitch. Now, how would you describe that? Let's say that I determine um, playing a piano, right? The different notes on a piano, you can hear them, right? You don't just notice it just was one sound. You hear different sounds with different notes. That's what this is important for. The bacillar membrane is so, so crucial to us hearing different frequencies, different pitches. That's what's so cool about it. Now, the question is, how does it do that? Okay, so here we have the base of the bacillar membrane. Here we'll say is like the middle of the bacillar membrane, and here's the apex of the bacillar membrane. Remember, this is not an anatomically true diagram, but it's physiologically helpful. So again, here is going to be the base. Here's gonna be right here in like the middle of the bacillar membrane, and here is going to be the apex of the bacillar membrane. And then you know down here, wherever the perilymph mixes together between the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani, they call that the helicotrema. Now, the highest frequency waves, highest frequency waves are going to stimulate the base. So the highest frequency waves are going to be stimulating the base of the bacillar membrane. The reason why is the bacillar membrane is stiffer, really, really stiff, and, and the fibers are really short. So they're really short and really stiff fibers towards the base. As you go towards the apex, they become longer fibers and really floppy, all right? They're not as tight now. The elastic fibers, as you go down, the elasticity starts decreasing. They're not as stiff. So if you think about it, higher frequency sounds, higher pitch sounds are gonna stimulate the bass first. Then if you continue to go down, let's say that you, it's a little bit higher, a uh, little bit lower frequency, but not super, super low. That's gonna stimulate the middle. And the lowest frequency sounds are gonna move where? all the way down to the apex, okay? So the highest frequency sounds are gonna stimulate the base because this is where the fibers are stiffer. So it's gonna cause more bend within the bacillar membrane there. Lower frequencies aren't gonna cause any type of bending within the bacillar membrane there. So now, high frequency stimulates the base. Middle frequency, middle level frequency, or intermediate level frequency is obviously going to stimulate right within the middle of the bacillar membrane. But the lowest frequency, the lowest frequency waves are going to be stimulating the apex. Okay, so now you might be asking yourselves the question, well, Zach, I know that you said the highest frequency stimulates the base, the lowest frequency stimulates the apex. Well, what's the, the minimum amount of frequency that we need to hear something? And what's the highest frequency that we can hear? Good question, guys. It's right around 20 to 20,000 hertz. So anything below 20, you can't hear, right? What would happen if it's below 20 hertz? Guess what? You know how this, the actual fluid fill vibrations move across the scale of vestibuli? If they pass the apex and go right to the helicotrema and to the scale of tympani, guess what? It's not gonna bend the bacillar membrane. If it doesn't bend the bacillar membrane, what is that gonna do? It's not gonna produce any movement in the bacillar membrane. It's not gonna stimulate the structures called the hair cells. That's really important. Anything higher, we can't hear also. Okay, so too high, above 20,000 hertz, we can't hear. Now, normal conversation between people is usually normal. So this is the, the, the actual extremes. But normal conversation is like 1,500 to like 4,000 hertz. So this is what most people are sensitive to. So you can hear within this range, but most conversations where our ears, our human ears are sensitive to is between 1,500 to 4,000 hertz. Okay. So now we should have a pretty good understanding here of the bacillar membrane. Again, just a quick recap. Towards the base, very stiff, very short diameter fibers, they're gonna be having stimulus due to the highest frequency.
In the middle, they're going to respond to the middle level frequency. And towards the apex, the fibers are really long, they're really floppy, so they're not going to actually be uh, needing high frequency, they're going to respond to low frequency waves. And again, normal frequency that we are sensitive to is 1500 to 4000, but the range that we can hear from is 20 to 20,000 hertz. Last thing before I move on here, since we're here, might as well, is another part of the graph here. Let's say I have another graph here, and we go based on time and pressure. And now I have like this, okay, I have this graph here. So you're going to see variations in amplitude here, okay, here let me make it a little bit, little bit better here, right there. Okay, so you're going to notice that if I go throughout this graph, you're going to notice that the height of the graph changes from here to here, from here to here, little bits of difference, right? So amplitude is important because it determines the height of the graph, so amplitude Amplitude is determined by like the height of the graph, right? But now the, the thing is with amplitude, amplitude determines how loud something is. So amplitude is really designed to determine how loud something is. So it determines the loudness, the intensity of the sound. So now, if I'm just talking really low and stuff like that, dude, you know, that's a low amplitude. But if I'm like, hey, you know, I, I increase the actual sound level. The amplitude increases. Why is that important? Think about it again. Amplitude is going to cause more of the bacillar membrane to vibrate. So higher amplitude is going to actually cause vibrations within multiple parts of the bacillar membrane. Whereas low amplitude will only stimulate very, very small or minute amounts of the bacillar membrane. If you only stimulate little amounts of the bacillar membrane, that's only going to activate a little bit of hair cells. Only activating a little bit of hair cells is only going to send very little action potentials. So you're going to perceive the decrease in action potentials as a decrease in sound. You'll respond to an increase in action potentials due to an increase in sound. So amplitude is basically saying the louder I speak, the more that tympanic membrane vibrates, the more the stapes taps on the oval window, the more fluid fill vibrations I have, the more the bacillar membrane moves, the more the hair cells activate, and the more action potentials, okay? So that should take care of that. Now that we got this down, the frequency, the amplitude, the bacillar membrane, understanding that actual movement of it, we should be good now to come back to this. Okay, so now we have the vestibular membrane, the bacillar membrane, a couple more structures here, and then we can go ahead and finally get started on this. Um, right up above this, in, um, looking through the Guyton and Hall physiology textbooks, they talk about something really, really interesting that I wanted to include here. This right here is a little type of like protein like lamina structure. They call this structure the reticular lamina. Okay? So you have down here, you have the base bacillar membrane, right? And the bacillar membrane is actually has like this nice little basal lamina. But then look, you see how we have this basement membrane, or the bacillar membrane, sorry, connecting to the reticular lamina through these nice little, like, rods? You know what they call these? They call those the actual rods of Corti, right? So they call these the pillars of Corti or the rods of Corti. But what happens is it connects it to the reticular lamina. And then there's this little tunnel here. They call it the, the tunnel of Corti, right? Now, here's what we got to understand, right? So we have here vestibular membrane. We have bacillar membrane. We have this area which is rich in endolymph, this area is rich in perilymph. We have this bacillar membrane, we have this reticular lamina, which is connected to it through the rods of Corti, and there's a little tunnel there called the tunnel of Corti. What else is really important? You see these hair cells? These are your little hair cells. These are the parts that are really, really important. So you have two types of hair cells. One of these, you only have one row of them. What do I mean by row? Imagine here for a second, let's say I have one hair cell and I have like a row of them going this way, okay? So here's a row of them going this way, down that way, right? This is my hair cells going that way. Right next to it, I'm gonna have these other hair cells. And these other hair cells, you're gonna have three rows of them, right? So I might have three rows of these guys, all right? This is, there's a reason why I'm telling you this. These hair cells move all the way down that bacillar membrane throughout the whole length of the entire cochlear duct. So imagine this moving all the way that way, this moving all the way that way. It's not just one area. I'm just zooming in on one point. So now, the inner hair cells, 
they're, they're fewer. We only have one row of them, and they don't make up as many hair cells, kind of like around 3,000, 4,000 hair cells, whereas this one's like 12,000 hair cells, tons and tons of hair cells for this one. So these, this blue cells, these blue hair cells, these are called the inner hair cells. These are the ones that primarily respond to sound waves. 95%, you see this black neurons here? You see these black neurons that are going to these hair cells? These are like the, basically the peripheral processes of what's called this spiral ganglion. All right, so there's a ganglion over here, and this ganglion is called the spiral ganglion. And the spiral ganglion has a central process which goes to the central nervous system, and a peripheral process which goes to these little detectors, the hair cells. 95% of these peripheral processes go to the hair cells. Isn't that crazy? Only about five to maybe 10% of them go to the outer hair cells. So because of that, even though there's more plentiful amounts of hair cells, they're still not the ones that are really playing a role within the sound. They help to be able to modify sound. And we'll talk about that after. We're not gonna get into that just yet, but again, remember inner hair cells, they have more of these afferent nerve terminals coming to them than the outer hair cells do. So these play more of a role within the sound, and these are playing a role within basically modulating the sound. All right, we'll talk about that. All right, couple more structures I promise, guys. All right, this red structure above these guys. This is an important structure. This red structure is called the tectorial membrane. And it's kind of like this mucopolysaccharide protein-like structure here. What happens between these hair cells and the tectorial membrane is what we're now going to get ready to cover. Okay, so we come back to this point here. Here's the actual stapes. It's tapping on the oval window. As it taps on the oval window, it creates fluid-filled vibrations within the scala vestibuli. If it moves and hits a point of the actual bacillar membrane, it actually will move through the actual scala, tim, uh, scala media and bend a part of the bacillar membrane, causing it to vibrate. As this vibrates, something really interesting happens. So as this vibrates, what's really cool is these inner hair cells, they have different points on them, okay? They have these things called stereocilia, and they have a really big one called the kinocilium. We're gonna zoom in on them, but I want you to understand something. Whenever there is these fluid-filled vibrations, it vibrates the bacillar membrane. As it vibrates the bacillar membrane, the endolymph rushes through this area between the tectorial membrane and the hair cells. As that endolymph rushes through this area between the tectorial membrane and the hair cells, it causes the hair cells to shear against the tectorial membrane. So as the hair cells shear towards against the tectorial membrane, it moves the little hairs. And that's what is really, really important. So again, one last time here, the actual stapes is tapping on the oval window, creates fluid-filled vibrations within the scala vestibuli, goes through the scala media. If it's a appropriate frequency and amplitude, it'll cause the bacillar membrane to vibrate. As the bacillar membrane vibrates, it causes endolymph to rush between the tectorial membrane and the hair cells causing the shearing of the hair cells against the tectorial membrane. Now, what's really cool about this? Let's come and zoom in on this hair cell here. Let me get this out of the way. Okay, so these hair cells, we have to zoom in on them because they're, they're really interesting. They're really, really cool. Um, I, I think that hearing is probably one of the most complex um, mechanotransduction pathways in the body. It's, it's very, very uh, complex, this stuff. Okay, so here we have an inner hair cell, and here we have an outer hair cell. And if you were wondering what these green cells were, those are just your supporting cells. There's many different types of supporting cells. They have what's called phalangeal cells or diter cells, Hansen cells. There's so many different types of supporting cells. All these green cells, just to make sure that we understand here, these are just your supporting cells. They're not playing a role in any type of action potentials. They're just giving support to these inner and outer hair cells. More prominently the outer, though. Okay. So zooming in on the structure, here's the inner hair cell, here's the outer hair cell. The inner hair cell, which is the one that we said is more primarily responding to sound, has these specific structures on these little like projections. What are these projections called? So they call these projections, these little like hair-like projections here, they call them stereo cilia, okay? So they call these little hair-like projections stereo cilia. 
Then they have a special name for the long stereocilia. The long stereocilia is called a kinocilium. Okay? It's called the kinocilium. So you have these little stereocilia, and then the biggest stereocilia has a special type of name. They call it a kinocilium. Now, in between these stereocilia, you have these channels on their actual membrane. But you have these proteins that are connecting these different channels. They call these little uh, connections, they call them tip links. Tip links. And these are just basically proteins. They're actually cadherins. If you really want to know, it's cadherin 23 and protocadherin 15. And these are just proteins that are connecting the channels from the different stereocilia. Now, above this hair cell, what is this structure up here? This is called the tectorial membrane. We're just kind of zooming in on it. Here's the tectorial membrane. And then what's this right here? This blue structure, again, we're make, making sure that we remember, this blue structure is called the reticular lamina and then down here is going to be the bacillar membrane and then what is this part here these are called the rods of cordy and then the tunnel of cordy is in between now we said that the bacillar membrane will vibrate when it vibrates let's say that the bacillar membrane goes up right so it's vibrating and it's going up as it goes up the reticular lamina will move. So this kind of moves as one whole unit, the bacillar membrane, the reticular lamina, the rods of cordy. They're moving as one rigid unit. So as the bacillar membrane moves up, the reticular lamina helps to pull the hair cells inward. As it pulls the hair cells inward, guess what happens? These small little stereocilia, they start moving. Because what happens is in between this tectorial membrane and the hair cell, what did we say was moving through here? Endolymph. Lots of endolymph. And the endolymph is rich in potassium. We said that that was the most important component. It's going to flow through here. As it flows through here, the endolymph pushes on the stereocilia, right? And, and as it pushes on the stereocilia, they beat towards a certain direction. Now, here's the important part. If the, the stereocilia beat towards this big stereocilia called the kinocilium, something special happens. So again, remember, as these stereocilia, the little ones, beat towards the big one called the kinocilium, it actually stretches the tip links and opens up these channels. Now, who comes in? Who comes in? Who's really rich out in this area? Potassium. So whenever the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium, it opens up these channels and potassium starts flooding in to this area. You know there's another ion that's also really important too, because not only does potassium move in, but some certain types of divalent ions move in as well. Guess what else moves in? Calcium. So calcium is another one that's really important. So not only does potassium move in, but so can calcium. Now, this cell was originally at resting membrane potential. All right, it was just being stabilized by sodium potassium pumps and potassium leaky channels. But look what starts happening. We start increasing the calcium in the cell, and we start increasing the potassium inside the cell. What is that going to do to the cell? It's going to depolarize the cell. So it's going to produce a change inside of the cell's membrane potential. What do I mean? It's going to lead to, again, depolarization. And as it becomes depolarized, guess what happens? Remember that calcium? As it becomes depolarized, remember the calcium that we said came in? There's kind of a special reason for it. Calcium actually comes over here. And you know there's different types of synaptoproteins on the membrane and on the vesicle? It stimulates those to actually fuse together. So when calcium helps to stimulate the fusion of these actual vesicles with the actual basal, basal lateral cell membrane, so now look what happens. This is going to connect. And after they connect, guess who can start coming out here into this area? This chemical that we're going to release is going to be a primary neurotransmitter here called glutamate. 
There's another one that can be released, but that's more within the vestibule, and that's called aspartate. But the big one here is glutamate. So now, glutamate is gonna act on these little peripheral processes coming from the spiral ganglia. Remember this ganglia on here that we talked about? This is called the spiral ganglion. We said that this was a really important one, right? So there's the peripheral process and the central process. The glutamate is gonna stimulate the peripheral processes. And then what happens to the action potentials moving down the peripheral process then to the central process? It's going to increase. So there's gonna be lots of action potentials. It's just so darn cool, man. This is crazy how this stuff works. All right, so now that we understand here, if the stereocilia move towards the kinocilium, potassium, calcium ions will leak in, depolarize it, trigger the release of glutamate. So remember, if the stereocilia beat towards the kinocilium, it depolarizes this hair cell. If the stereocilia move away from the kinocilium, it will hyperpolarize the cell, all right? And if it's at rest, nothing's gonna happen generally, okay? So again, whenever you hyperpolarize the cell, the actual stereocilia will move away from the kinocilium. And as it moves away from the kinocilium, these channels will close, potassium, calcium can't enter, and it'll cause the hyperpolarization of the membrane. Next question that you might have, how do we get the potassium really high in this area? How do we do that? Remember I told you there was a special, special structure here called the stria vascularis. There's actually this specialized cells here. And these specialized cells here are secreting potassium at a pretty constant rate. Okay, so what is this structure here called? It's called the stria vascularis. It's actually really cool here. I wanna show you something here. I'm gonna move this for a second. And I just wanna show you something real quick because I think it's so darn cool and it plays a really important role into us understanding how this stuff happens. Let's say I kinda come over here here you have your, this outer part here, this black part. They call it the spiral ligament. And the spiral ligament has special cells here called fibrocytes. So here's a fibrocyte. Then you have special cells that are connecting between that. So here's another cell, and these are called your basal cells. Then you have another one over here, and these are called your intermediate cells. And then you have one last one, which is towards this edge here, and these are called your marginal cells. The whole point here is we take potassium from this area out here by the fibrocytes within this, the actual spiral ligament and we move this potassium all the way across these layers and into the actual scala media where the endolymph is. So it's, it's extremely, extremely important to be able to maintain what's called the endo cochlear potential, not potential, potential, okay? This is why it's really, really important. So the stria vascularis is really, really important for being able to push potassium through multiple cell layers like the fibrocytes, the basal cells, the intermediate cells, and even the marginal cells into the endolymph. The mechanisms, it goes through different types of sodium, potassium, two chloride co-transporters and potassium channels. It's not necessarily that important, but what's really important is to understand that the scala media, the endolymph is actually being maintained a nice layer of, a nice amount of potassium due to the specialized structure called the strivascularis. Okay, so now we have a good idea of how this actual inner hair cell is being stimulated. We have one last thing to talk about, and that's the outer hair cells. Now remember I told you that these ones, they, they only play a small role in that actual picking up sound waves. So they do have tip links and different types of potassium and calcium uh, channels. But remember I told you that they're more important with being able to modulate sound. So let's take the two extremes. Okay, there's different types of pathways, okay? One of them is actually gonna be an efferent pathway. We'll talk about this in the auditory pathways. For right now, you just gotta trust me that this nerve is coming from what's called the olivo-cochlear bundle within the brainstem, okay? Olivo-cochlear bundle. 
And the olivocochlear bundle is releasing specific types of chemicals such as acetylcholine. All right. Acetylcholine can bind onto these channels, and the overall effect of it is to be able to induce potassium ions to leave the cell. All right. And if potassium ions leave the cell, what's the ultimate goal? It'll cause hyperpolarization of the cell. Okay, well, there's another thing that they believe to be working here. There's special proteins that are kind of connected on this actual outer hair cell. And these protein molecules are really interesting. They're like contractile units. These proteins are called Preston. So these proteins are called Preston. They believe them to be, play a role in being able to contract the cell, to change the shape of the cell. So let's take two situations. Let's say that you're in your car or something like that, or you're, you're taking your music, you're putting your, your, yeah, you're putting the headphones on. You don't realize that your volume is up to max, and you turn the thing on, and it just blasts out, right? You don't want to damage the hair cells. So your actual body has an amazing way of dealing with this. So let's say you take that example. Really, really high amplitude, really, really loud sound. Activates the olivocochlear bundle. The olivocochlear bundle will send action potentials to release acetylcholine. If acetylcholine is released, it's going to hyperpolarize the cell. But guess what it does to the Preston molecules? They don't contract. Instead, they will relax. As they relax, the cell lengthens. If the cell lengthens, it pulls the bacillar membrane down. If you pull the bacillar membrane down, it also pulls the reticular lamina away, right? So now endolymph isn't going to be flowing through this area as well. What is that doing? Causing this downward, dang it, downward bowing, they call it, of the bacillar membrane decreases bacillar membrane vibrations. And if there's decreased bacillar membrane vibrations, that's going to decrease the hair cell activation. And this is more of a protective mechanism. Okay? So remember, when we talk about the actual outer hair cell, it has more efferent fibers going to it than it does have afferent. Remember the actual very small amount of it plays a role within the sound uh, transduction. If high sounds, acetylcholine, hyperpolarization, Preston molecules relax, the hair cell elongates. As the hair cell elongates, it causes the downward bowing of the bacillar membrane. If the bacillar membrane isn't vibrating as much due to the downward bowing, there's going to be less shearing of the hair cells. Less shearing of the hair cells means decreasing the activation of the hair cells. That means decreased action potentials. So it's a really cool way of protecting our, 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 uh, our hair cells. Then there's the opposite. Let's say that you want to be able to distinguish different frequencies very, very sharply. So you're at an orchestra or something like that, I don't know, and you're listening to different types of sounds. You're listening to the drums, you're listening to the flute, you're listening to the clarinet, whatever. I don't know instruments that well, but the, the point is that you're listening to different instruments. There's a way for you to be able to remove any background noise and focus on one specific type of sound. Like some people, they might be like, oh, I'm listening more to the drums than I'm listening to the flute, the guitar, and everything else. Our body has a really cool way of dealing with that because we can remove any type of background noise and specifically be able to discriminate frequencies very, very sharply. Guess how? We actually have these Preston molecules contract. If the Preston molecules contract, again, guess what's going to happen? It's going to cause the upward bowing of the bacillar membrane. If the bacillar membrane bows upward, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have hair cell activation. So if you have the opposite, let's say upward bowing, due to the Preston molecules contracting and shortening and pulling the bacillar membrane upward, that upward bowing, bowing is going to increase the hair cell activation. And this is really important for being, uh, being able to, dis uh, to discriminate certain types of frequencies and removing any type of background noise. So I think that's super cool. So remember, purpose of the outer hair cells and the overall function is they modulate the actual sound process, the hearing, by doing what? Having efferent fibers coming to them, one way is they can cause the downward bowing due to really loud sounds to protect the hair cells. 
So they can cause the pressin molecules to relax, lengthening the hair cell, decreasing the actual bacillar membrane vibrations, and decreasing hair cell activation. On the other hand, if you want to be able to discriminate frequencies really, really sharply, right, by listening to different sounds, with, by blocking other ones out, you can cause the pressin molecules to contract. If they contract, they shorten. They pull the bacillar membrane upward, causing an upward bowing, which causes more shearing of the hair cells, which causes more hair cell activation. So that's so cool. I love that concept there. All right, engineers, so we just pretty much finished up the cochlea. I hope all of it made sense. I really do hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you guys did, please hit that like button. Comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, go check out our Instagram, our Facebook, and our Patreon account. If you guys have the opportunity to be able to donate, we would truly appreciate it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.